Good day and welcome to the Leading with Nice interview series podcast. My name is Matthew Yule. And as usual, we want to help you inspire others, build loyalty and get results. So today's guest, I put an ask out like probably, oh, maybe a year ago. And um, it's like trying to book a celebrity because uh, there's just so much going on uh, for Christina that, you know, finally now in 2022, we are finally able to meet up. Christina Lowen mm. is the executive director at the Association for Opera in Canada. And she's been there for 13 years, which in uh, 2022 years is like a hundred years, basically, <laughs> because nobody stays at one place for that long anymore. Uh, I'm trying to figure so out what they, have, what they have over her. Like what is what the skeleton <laughs> in the closet that the board <laughs> keeps over her. But before that, she toured with the Royal Winnipeg ballet both domestically and internationally which must have been so cool and she also served as a director of marketing at opera ontario christina thank you so much for taking time to chat with us today pleasure thank you so much for featuring me on the podcast i'm happy to be here so we worked together on a project last year which is how i came to know uh about you and your team and um Lots of people, lots of people that uh, come on this show i've for, i've had the fortune to work with so if you're wondering, that's how Christine and I came to know each other. Now, the one thing we talked about a lot when we were on this project, we were still in like hardcore pandemic time. Um, you know, nobody was going outside, but you were still leading an association made up of members whose like main purpose is public performance. Mm-hmm. That's right. What were you hearing from your members? What were, what did they need from you? What were you doing? I just I just love to hear like your mindset mm-hmm. of how you were leading an association, and not just not just like like again, many of our members uh, work regionally. You were coast to coast, mm-hmm. so the That's needs right. of a of an opera company on the west coast would be different from one in Montreal. Uh, what, how are you managing? Just tell us. Just tell us. Give yeah. us the fire hose of information. <laughs> Well, you know, to and even to complicate it being a national association, healthcare is provincial. Yes. <laughs> right. So, in a healthcare crisis um, or a health crisis like the pandemic, um, you know, you might be leading nationally, but you're telling, you know, you're telling it through the story of all of the, the, the provinces and, you know, the all of the precautions and everything are have always been, you know, completely or, you know, significantly different from, from place to place. So, some places might be in lockdown, some not, some have masks, some don't. And it's just this constant changing, evolving um, situation. Um, but that's been that's been the soup that we've been living in for the past two and a half years. But you know, if you wanted me, if you wanted to take a you know take a journey back to those early days um, in March uh, when the lockdown first happened, um, I mean, it was uh, it was like everything just ground to a complete halt. Um, and, and nobody, it was, nobody knew anything about anything. And, you know, that's the experience that most people had in the world at this time. Um, no more live performance, um, you know, lots of questions, no answers, lots of confusion. Um, we, as an association, uh, sent out an, a couple of surveys because we said we we need to really know what's going on here. We need to know how many how many shows have been canceled. How like who's who's on the line? How are people doing? And you know what we discovered at that point was actually really alarming. Um, we at the time we actually only represented organizations. We only had organizational members, mm-hmm. and we thought you know let's let's see how artists are doing. And so we sent out a survey through our social media. So we. Did you know, we could talk directly to our members because we have their their contact information, but we didn't have any way to talk to artists. So we we sent out a um, a survey through through our social media channels. We had something like over five hundred responses, wow. and it, it was it was very alarming and grim. Um, you know, we found out that you know uh, I can't exactly remember what the stories were, but there was like a significant number of artists that could not meet basic needs like in the next three weeks. Mm. Like it was a very serious, urgent um, situation. There was a need for um, immediate cash, right? Like it's a, it's already a very precarious, um, uh, artists are already very precarious mm. in the opera industry. So, you know, with, with performances, you know, just 
completely being canceled, some being paid out at different percentages, different rates, some at full amount, some farther down the line, just, you know, saying these are being postponed, they're going to happen, we just don't know when. Um, so we sprang into action, right? We just thought, what what can we do? And we thought, you know, we, well, we have to help. We got to help in any way we can. And we immediately started to focus on uh, and on opera artists. And one of the first things we did is we created an emergency opera artist relief fund. And we did this like overnight. I'm so proud of the board for this. We were just like, let's help artists now. And, and so we just created this fund and like really went to this Google form and said, you know, times are tough. I need some money. And then, you know, we were able to, you know, start, start sending out uh, payments of, you know, $500, uh, you know, to anybody really who needed it. Mm -hmm. And that fund is actually still, still active today and still goes through its uh, cycles of uh, high demand and, um, you know, lower demand. And those are, we, we, we can track uh, how things are going often in the sector by um, how the, uh, the applications for the opera artist relief fund. Uh, I love how you say, trend upwards. I like how you say that, you know, oh, we like spring into action overnight. Like there's a lot of you, there's like you, <laughs> there's you, a volunteer board. Uh, that's amazing. That's, that's, I don't think, so if you're listening if you're listening and you're thinking, oh, I wish we had the resources to do that kind of thing, just from not financially, but just from people thing, just, you know, the Association for Opera in Canada did not have the resources either. Like they, you know, people made decisions as to what was important and other priorities were sacrificed to focus on this, right? That was, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, huh. and you know, the pandemic hit at a very strange time in the growth trajectory of mm. the association. At the time, we were still called opera.ca, which is actually our founding, our founding organizational name. Um, but we, um, we, like I said, we were on a growth trajectory. So we had just been notified that we'd had a long overdue increase to our core grants. Mm -hmm. And what this was allowing us to do was to start building up our human resources. So yes, I, I have become accustomed to talking about, you know, the royal we, even yeah. though for most of the 13 years that I've been at uh, AOC, it has been just me yeah. as the only full-time staff member. Yeah. Um, but because of the increases to our, our operating grant through special um, project funding, we got, we got so much special project funding for uh, programs that we devised over the pandemic, we've been able to build up our staff capacity. So, you know, we have the equivalent of three full-time or three FTEs, which is actually yeah. something like six staff, right, on different size contracts. But, you know, we're, we're now actually like a, a full team of uh, wonderful humans hey, that you are know, let's, for us. Let's talk about that. And this is not, as you know, if you listen to this podcast, we send the questions over early because, uh, or in advance, because, you know, this is, we're trying to learn here, right? So we're not trying to trick or surprise anybody. So let's talk about that because I know a lot of people who listen are solo, I say solopreneurs, because when you're the executive director of a nonprofit or charity or association, it's like, it's very entrepreneurial. So when you're in that position and you now it's time to start thinking about maybe somebody else can join you, maybe a few other people can join you. What are some, if you, if somebody came to you and said, Christina, I am you two years ago now, just what do I need to think about? Give some advice on like, what are some things they should think about and approach and how to go about it? Like, do you just throw up a, an ad on charity village and cross your fingers or what, like, what, how does it work? Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you my story, yeah, please. Uh, what I did, you know, well, and I, I know, I, and I know you got a great person. Like, so I know something went yeah. right. Yeah. Well, but my, my original plan, I thought, you know, I, I have this, uh, I, we have some extra capacity in our budget now. I'm going to, now I'm going to hire somebody. And so I devised a job description and I did these interviews and I, you know, I met some amazing people, but things just weren't quite meshing. And I had, I had something going on in my head and I was thinking, I have this like just a little germ of an idea. Um, and, and I, and it just, it just kept growing and growing. And I just kept thinking, I, I feel like I'm trying to solve a new world problem with an old world solution. You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. life is very different right now. And, and I'm trying, I'm trying to grow, you know, or try to build in a way that, that exists for a world that we, we don't live in anymore. You know, we're, we're remote, we're all working or, you know, I'm working from home. I don't have an office. How am I going to train somebody? You know, what does that look like to, you know, 
onboard somebody. There were so many, um, so many questions about how to, you know, create this new full-time staff person. And the idea that I had that was playing around in my mind was that, you know, I had this sum of money, right? It was a, you know, an arts salary, let's face yeah. it. It wasn't great, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I thought, you know, I can hire one person and, and we can go through this, you know, year or two and, you know, figure things out. And then I thought, but what if, and this was my, my, my idea that was cooking in my brain at the time. I was like, what if I take that same amount of money and I use it and create like a cascading spreadsheet that leverages that money, right, um, into, it sounds like a pyramid, a staffing pyramid scheme. But basically, I was leveraging that money through the, through the SUS, the wage subsidy program. Yeah. So I took that initial position, and I was like, how much wage subsidies does, does this generate? And I was like, oh, it generates, you know, 70%. Okay, what kind of job does that look like? Oh, 30 hours a week? Okay, great. How much, you know, how much wage subsidy does that generate? You know, and then it, it just kept rolling down. And I'm like, oh, that's a 20 hour a week position. And then and here's a 12 hour a week position. And so I was able to create this structure until it just became like, this is not even a, a viable work opportunity. I think the smallest one was 12 weeks, uh, 12 hours, 12 hours a week. Um, but it actually, I, through that one salary, I was able to create seven positions. Wow. And I hired seven artists for eight weeks. Um, they spent the summer with us. They called themselves the Portfolio Artist Collective, and they all had different um, different roles and responsibilities. One of them wrote a grant and, and secured a forty eight thousand dollar grant. Um, but you know, just through that process of having suddenly, you know, you go from just yourself to a team of seven staff members. It was like a crash course in building a team, having staff, having staff meetings, organizing people, HR. Yeah. All Onboarding, training, all of that in eight weeks. Um, so it was it was mutually beneficial, right? Like it was so, such a great experience for me, and then also a really great opportunity for the artists that we hired. Um, just so you know, the name of this podcast will be now be called the Pyramid, the Staffing Pyramid, <laughs> with Christina Lowen. So <laughs> that that is brilliant. Um, I'm going to figure. How can I do that with my staff? Um, now, Naomi, you have to pay Jamie every time. No, uh, I love it. That's great. So yeah, like that is brilliant. Um, so I'll just ask one last question on this. How did you like, again, somebody's coming to you today saying, I love what you did. Uh, what would be a tip you might give them on the training or like the culture piece? Like, how do you, how do you kind of introduce culture in an online environment like you were? Well, you know, I mean, I, culture is really important. Values are really yeah. important as well. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, our entire response through the pandemic um, has been one of deep care, mm. right? So I would say that, you know, we had a responsibility to care for each other, to understand who is most at risk and who has privilege. Um, and through that realization, um, you know, be able to take on that responsibility of, of care um, in a way that is really meaningful and, and personal, right? Like to care for each other um, is how is how we we moved forward. And so that was the, one of the guiding principles and guiding values that um, I, I wanted to build with that team of, of seven um, that year was to really make sure that they knew that uh, we were working in a caring environment and yeah. they were also, yeah. you know, also uh, responsible for delivering care as well as services. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's actually really, that's, there's a lot to chew on there, I think, and that can be applied in individual uh, realities as well, too. I don't think you, I don't think uh, another executive director hears this and goes, oh, I get it, just care and that'll work. Yeah, you know, I think you need to apply it to like your reality, like how does care yeah. apply? That's really, that was okay. There you go. Bonus question and really good answer. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is, and you touched on a lot of them, but the challenges and learnings encountered as you led through the pandemic. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear about like, what is something you're still processing uh, that is still a reality? And like you said, um, I think, I'm not sure if we discussed this before we started recording or not, like shows and operas just coming back online now. Mm -hmm. 
but what are some things you're still processing and like hearing from your members and and figuring out a way forward still? Well, you know, I, I guess it's just, you know, learning to um, accept that constant ambiguity and uncertainty, you know, uh, and, and learning or, or trying to learn to be comfortable with that. Um, I mean, certainty is something that we all crave and we gravitate towards. Um, but in this new reality that we're in, there there actually is no certainty. And so we have, you know, multiple timelines, many different scenarios, lots and lots of contingencies. Um, and, and we have to be structured in a way that, you know, allows us to be as uh, flexible as possible and not too rigid so that we can, you know, move, move with the times, right? So that we are flexible enough to, to change things when, when we need to change them. Mm. Um, you know, per, like professionally, personally, professionally, um, I think that one of the things that's affecting a lot of, lot of leaders in the sector right now is, uh, is fatigue, right? Um, and this is not just happening with the leaders, but, you know, this state of constant uncertainty, nonstop, uh, plans and since, you know, that are changing all the time, all these concurrent scenarios that are running through your mind at every, at any moment, um, you know, it's, it's, it's leading to this place where it's like, you have to constantly be making decisions. You, you need to, you need to innovate a lot. I mean, we've been through a period of like, i like forced unplanned innovation. Right. And, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, in 2015, innovation was really buzzy, right? It was like, we got to yeah. innovate, we got to yeah. innovate, you know? And I remember it's like, I know we need to have all these programs to support innovation. And, yeah. you know, and I talked to, I talked to a good, a, a, a good colleague at Canadian Heritage at the time. And he said, you know, he says, Christina, you know, organizations that in general, they don't innovate until they approach market failure. Mm. And I was like, oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> I, I mean, I wouldn't want that to happen. Um, but that's what happened, right? Um, you know, lockdown is market failure because that's that's what we do. We do the yeah. live arts and suddenly there was no live arts. And so we entered into a period of, of rapid innovation, you know, but without the excitement of it, you know? Um, so I was saying like in 2015, I had done this program called the Lean Performing Arts. And the premise behind the lean performing arts was, you know, was a question. It was like, what would happen if we treated arts organizations like startups? And so we took them through this entire process of, uh, of, of being a startup. Uh, so we used all of the principles in the lean startup book and we put uh, about uh, 10 or 12 different organizations um, through this lean startup boot camp for about six to eight weeks. And it was a really interesting program. Um, but it was a curiosity more than mm. anything. People were like, that's really interesting, but you know, they couldn't quite figure out what it was and what it's, uh, it, it didn't really take root. I mean, I think people were saw people found it fascinating, but it just didn't take root as a, as a movement. And then it's just so funny because now it's like fast forward seven years into the future and everybody's talking about design thinking empathy yeah. interviews, minimum viable product, you know, it's like, so all of these, uh, all this term these, this lean terminology is now, you know, front of mind, you know, everybody's iterating, mm. everyone's pivoting. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. So, so you know, when, why can comments. we not, yeah. Can we not get back to creating synergy? I mean, like that was you know, creating <laughs> synergy and now we have to be pivoting. What happened about what happened to taking things offline? Now we're like integrative thinking, uh, design thinking. I, um, you know, it's funny. So leading with nice uh, was originally born out of these some research I did on successful leaders, and but the ones that I would want to follow. Like, there's lots of successful people that are not nice and don't have any qualities that I would uh, espouse as being great, but they still do well and they're successful. But the ones that I would want to follow, uh, empathy was one of the you know biggest pieces. Uh, of an aptitude they really excelled in. And I remember like it was 2005 and I was, you know, telling a leader, you know, how they could increase their empathy. And they listened to me with great interest. And they're like, listen to me like, and you really believe this. 
podcast. And I was like, yeah, oh. like I really do. And like, so now that same, it's funny because that same guy was at his cottage two summers ago or last summer. And uh, he said to me, he's like, you know, I think I'm a bit nicer now. Like you say, <laughs> he's had to be. I'm like, yeah, dude, because I never, everybody would have quit over the last two years if you weren't. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's funny how, you know, finally this, this stuff is starting to, starting to cream is starting to rise to the top. Um, yeah. So you're even, uh, this is the kind of the next question I had, uh, this is you, you were, you were already starting to answer it mm. before I get, before I got <laughs> impatient to hear my own voice again. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, somewhere my wife is nodding her head. Um, there are some areas at the association for opera in Canada and actually the opera community in general found a need to focus on that it may not have thought of before pandemic. Um, what were some of those things specifically and that now are, are very top of money? You talked about like, you know, market failure having to close. So what, what did that open your eyes to in general? Um, and what are these things specifically that you need to think about regularly? Yeah. You know, the interesting thing about the the pandemic and the focus for the opera sector currently is um is that many of the challenges or the things that we we've decided to focus on are are actually things that pre-existed um the pandemic uh but they you know they weren't as um they weren't as intense they weren't maybe i mean they were urgent but they weren't as urgent as they are now right um and the pandemic of course you know really heightened so many of these these issues and challenges and i would say one of the biggest ones is is equity um mm. you know the incredible inequities that exist in our world um you know between the haves the have nots and the 1% but even when you just take that lens and just look at the way that you know our own microcosm exists, you know, just the opera sector, you know, and ask ourselves, what is, what is, where is the inequity in our own sector? Mm -hmm. And there's just so many, there's so many levels of inequity. And, you know, one of the largest ones, of course, that I started this whole conversation with is the fact that artists who are the, that they are the soul of our art form, right? Like the, the, opera doesn't exist without artists, right? <laughs> it's just such a basic, but they are the lowest paid and the most precarious worker of the entire sector, right? So, you know, you say, what was it like in those early days? It was, it was busy. It was, you know, chaotic. It was frightening, but you know what? It was also incredibly, you know, uh, you know, I just felt so privileged and lucky throughout that time to know that I had a job. Mm -hmm. Right. And that when so many people, you know, saw their livelihood dry up literally overnight, like Friday, you have a job. Saturday, you don't. Right. Um, your cash flow, you're like, hey, I think I'm okay for the next three months. And suddenly it's it's evaporated. Right. And here I am. I'm like, I have the privilege of working from my home. I don't even have to take the TTC. Everything's locked down, but I can just keep typing into my laptop and, and I still have a job. Um, and this is a situation that continues to play itself out. Like what is, in the news, we're hearing that, you know, what half the population of Canada now has COVID. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just so regular. It's like, yeah, I have COVID, I have a cold, you know, I, you, you know, you, you do your tests, you isolate for 10 days. And again, that's really easy if you're a remote worker, if you're in front of a camera like me right now on Zoom, right? But uh, it's not so easy, you know, if you were engaged uh, in a reopening production, right? Suddenly that's it. You've been replaced and, uh, you know, you're out of that gig. So it's, it's still, it's still happening. Right. And so, you know, our decision to, you know, refocus, refocus a lot of our programs and services on the artists was absolutely the right thing to do. The artist relief fund was only part of it. You know, we offered, we created a new member category. We said, you know, opera artists category, please join us. It was completely free. It's still free. So go to opera.ca and join to be an opera artist member. If you're watching this podcast, um, we have professional development, monthly um, online learning series. We have a fellowship mentorship program for early career artists because, you know, within artists, there are also other levels of cascading inequities, right? So just like how you know, we talk about, you know, 
what it is like now for millennials and Gen Z to buy a house. It's an impossibility, right? It's like generationally, um, you know, we need to focus on uh, early career artists um, as a focus area because they're the future. We have a new strategic plan that's very future focused, right? And so we need to also really make sure that uh, we're cultivating that area and that we have a very strong, um, resilient uh, sector of uh, of artists for the future. Um, can you just really briefly before we start to wrap up here, um, what people may not know about opera is it actually is very community base as well, not just in, within the people that work in opera, but also like as it stretches out into the communities opera exists. And can you just give, explain what that, when I, when I say that, I know that because you've told me can yeah. you, and I've seen it in action. Can you explain yeah. to people that are listening what that, what that means it looks like? Sure. So um, the opera sector is, um, is very interested in being able to um, not only make a difference in the communities that they serve, but be able to qualify and quantify and tell the story of the difference that they're making um, through evaluation and impact measurement. So this was the focus of a strategic plan from 2015 to 2020 called Charting Our Civic Impact. And basically our members asked us to create a collective framework that they could all speak through. So they asked us, what are the, what are the things we're going to measure that say, this is the impact that we're having in our community? And through the Opera Civic Impact Framework, we identified five major theme areas that opera companies were active in. So the number one um, domain or theme area where they have an impact is through the artistic experience. They also impact accessibility, um, education, community, and truth and reconciliation. And for each one of these theme areas, there are very specific things that uh, we're measuring, certain changes that we're, we're, um, we're seeking to um, changes we're seeking to make um, through these uh, through these theme areas. Um, and uh, and it's that framework that uh, that we were really proud to be able to secure um, a grant from the Canada Council's Digital Strategy Fund to digitize it and turn it into a platform so that opera companies could be engaged in actually measuring their impact online regardless of where their participants are. If you're an audience member, you can do it on your phone. If you're doing a community event, you can do it through roaming iPads or standalone signs, um, but you, everything gets deployed directly through the platform, mm -hmm. but then gets, um, gets uh, synthesized through, uh, through a common framework. So this is the, this is the Opera Impact Platform um, project. And, uh, and we're at this point, we've onboarded a hundred percent of our capacity for that, uh, for that platform. And as the opera sector now, you know, is, is starting to reopen, um, we're going to be starting the big work of populating that, that platform with data and looking forward to that big collective opera sector report on the impact that we're having hopefully in the fall. You've mentioned some uh, community events because opera actually does a lot of community work, right? Like it's, yeah. it's often out doing education in schools or charitable type work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. There is, there's like, there, there are many programs that, uh, that opera companies are engaged in directly in school, in school systems, doing um, touring, sort of touring programs where they work in schools and they deliver uh, opera programming through the public school systems. Um, there's also lots of community, community-based programming um, where people work with uh, community centers, people who are in at-risk at communities. I'm thinking of, um, you know, an example is uh, there was a, an opera company, our Vancouver Opera in, in British Columbia. They have something called the Kettle Choir. Um, and so they were working with um, some at-risk populations in Vancouver's east side, uh, creating this community choir. And through the community choir, they were able to um, work with um, individuals to help them build up their, their self-esteem, sense of belonging, people who are extremely isolated and stigmatized, um, and be, were able to create a program that you know, provided some joy and, and some dignity. Well, this is even more than generous with your time uh, today. Uh, 
before we wrap up, there's a, you know, it's not just uh, you and me uh, making this happen. Uh, behind me is a whole bunch of people that uh, get this happening. Naomi, uh, my EA, she helps write questions and she schedules you and I so we can meet here. Uh, Amber, uh, while I'm here chatting, I'm watching our Slack channel, like, you know, go back and forth because she's taking care of business. Um, Jeff Anhorn, if you're watching this on social or on YouTube, he's taking care of the editing. Austin Pomeroy, uh, my voice is actually much squeakier than what you're hearing now. He does all the audio editing, makes me sound like as handsome as I look. Um, thank you, Austin. Jamie's our content manager. If you saw this on social media, he's the reason he got it put together. And of course, uh, Allison, uh, my wife, makes sure the kids stay quiet while I'm doing this. So thank you, Allison. And listen, if you enjoyed this, if, if you found some value in what uh, Christina had to say, um, I want, to, I want to ask you to do two things. I'm supposed to do this every episode. I always forget. The first is, could you leave a five-star review? It helps other people discover the show. And uh, often what happens is somebody will come across it. They'll get it shared. And I'll get an email saying, I wish I knew about this long ago. So don't leave it to me to promote it. If you could help, I'll leave it a five-star review. And also, if you want to learn more about what Christina was talking about, opera.ca is still a domain, which is amazing. Like that, this is such an easy to remember uh, domain and also um if any bit of what she said resonated with you today uh take your family to the opera uh that's my ask uh for you today and uh you. we will consider this transaction this deal even you got some awesome content and uh you've gone to see some opera so you actually you win twice to be honest uh christina thank you so much for joining me today it's been thank a pleasure thank you so much thank you it is my pleasure as well thanks matthew no problem. Everybody else, uh, we'll talk to you next time. Have a great day.